Welcome to the London Politica podcast. This is where we join industry thought leaders and experts to uncover the nexus of politics, markets, and society. My name is Manas Chavla, and I'll be co-hosting today's episode with Shran Ong. The guest joining me today is a world-renowned sinologist. Previously, he has served as a senior British diplomat in Beijing, and currently he's the director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. He's also the best-selling author of over 20 books and has been a commentator for every major international news outlet. Uh, joining me from London, Dr. Kerry Brown, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm thrilled to speak to you. Hi, hello. Uh, you know, there's there's just so much to unpack today in this, you know, incredibly uh, and increasingly complex topic. Uh, I just want to start by getting an idea of what's on your radar right now as you look at China and as we look at the U.S.-China relationship. I mean, there's so many uh, potential flashpoints. Uh, you know, you can think of a trade war, a broader technological decoupling, the human rights abuses in China, uh, and of course, what we've seen going on in you know Hong Kong and more broadly Taiwan. Um, I think these are certainly the things that most people think about when they think about U.S.-China. But I'm curious, are there certain underrated political risks that are being left out of the mainstream conversation that you know, you're know keeping an eye out for in 2021? Well, I think neglected risks at the moment are ones which we thought about a lot in the past. And now we've kind of taken our eye off the ball. For instance, domestic issues in China. I mean, China's demographics is still a problem. There's still maybe a population that's aging quicker than any other society, perhaps rather than Japan. Uh, we've also got all of the extremely critical climate issues in China. We have issues of inequality and probably a lot of contention in Chinese society that isn't really being observed at the moment because from the outside, the country does look so powerful and so big. And that seems to be what absolutely obsesses everyone. Um, in the past, we tended to think an awful lot about how fragmented China was and how underneath the surface there was a lot of brittleness in its governance and its power. And I think that those things have not gone away. I mean, China is still in many ways an uh, environment which in human and natural terms has very, very significant problems. And although I think the current government under Xi Jinping has been well at communicating about its management of those problems, those problems are still there, and they're still were very, very difficult ones to deal with. In particular, the kind of journey that China is going to take to a middle-income status country, or is already in the middle of, has always been a very problematic one in other societies, politically and socially. And at the moment, fueled by nationalism, I think the government has been able to really control the narrative. But I don't think we should be complacent about this. China may well appear in the next few years to be in many ways domestically more unstable than was predicted. And we shouldn't be complacent about that. I mean, I hope that's not the case, but we shouldn't be complacent and assume that it's as strong as it might sometimes look to outsiders. Yeah, no, that's really fascinating. And I think that leads really well into my next question, um, because I do want to place this discussion in the broader uh, historical context uh, of China. Uh, because in just a few weeks, China is going to be celebrating the hundredth anniversary uh, of their, uh, you know, of the Communist Party, and that definitely will come with a reflection on their so-called centennial goals. And you know, I personally certainly think that in the last few years, we've seen something of an inflection point in the way that China defines itself and its goals, because uh, economic growth uh, has slowed down. In 2019 is around six percent, and you know that was somewhat inevitable. Like you pointed out, the population's aging, uh, and there's lots of other issues. Uh, and I think, you know, thus Xi Jinping's increasingly trying to anchor his legitimacy uh, in a broader ideological nationalism than just the material economic welfare uh, that the centennial goals promise. Um, and, and so my question is, Dr. Brown, from a Chinese perspective, what role does Xi Jinping's relationship with the United States play in the context of the centennial goals of his growing nationalism and the vision of the Communist Party as they seek to consolidate legitimacy both internationally and domestically? The role that the United States plays is that it's the most significant relationship that China as a country has. It's the unavoidable partner. And it's very hard to see these two being able to extricate themselves from each other. I mean, they almost need each other now. I think the United States in some ways always needs an enemy to define itself. And China is the perfect enemy. And I think for China, the United States has been a country and a culture that it is – 
really in a love-hate relationship with. I mean, it loves America and America hates it. So it's kind of very, very tough to get some balance about this. I mean, if you look at the complexity of the relationship, first of all, I mean, there are something like 90 formal dialogues. Oh, there were a couple of years ago, the State Department website before it was archived during the Trump presidency had 90 of these dialogues listed from intellectual property to biomedical standards to governance of the internet. I mean, very extensive dialogue and all of it official, not including unofficial dialogues, which are probably, uh, you know, in numerous. Um, on top of this, you've got the trade relationship. I mean, a couple of years ago, the data that I had was it was 600 billion US dollars of two-way trade a year, two-thirds of that in China's benefit, but still very, very significant and growing. And I think in the Trump era, despite the trade war, it continued to grow and the deficit continued to grow despite all his promises to do something about that. You have finance flows, the fact that China probably still has something like a trillion US dollars of treasuries. Uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State a decade ago, said you couldn't really have a fight with China for the United States because you couldn't argue with your banker. In a sense, China is still the banker for the United States, even though it may have tried to get away from some of this dependency. Finally, you have the fact that for global issues, climate change, pandemics, combating, uh, you know, kind of sustainability and dealing with artificial intelligence, these are two places that will have to work with each other. If the United States and China don't have common ground on these issues, then they're not going to be able to solve them. One uh, being a player and one not is not an option. They both have to play on this field. So it's really a kind of big question of the ways in which uh, the Communist Party of China has been framed by trying to emulate some of the things that it sees and it likes or has liked in the United States, but not wanting to embrace this complex question of, you know, Chinese, uh, uh, sorry, um, American values, American universalism, the fact that America, I think in Chinese eyes, particularly under Xi Jinping, where there's been a big pushback, is regarded as a proselytizing power. I think these are things that China doesn't want. It's made explicit it doesn't want them. And in the Xi Jinping era since 2012, we've lived in an era in which there is disambiguation. I mean, there's a, a desire to get rid of the ambiguity. I think that the answer that America in particular and the European Union were looking for from China of, you know, do you, through economic change, embrace political change that makes you going to, you know, kind of end up looking more like us? The answer at the moment is a resolute and unambiguous no. So I suppose in 2021, the United States is dealing with a pretty clear issue, a China that is capitalist in economic behavior, but communist in political identity. And in a sense, that is a soluble issue. I don't think this is an existential issue that the United States is facing, uh, but it's going to be one that means that remarkably, the United States is going to have to change, change its views about the world in which it exists and probably its views about itself. It will, in effect, have universal values which apply only to it and its allies, not to a wider world. And of course, that's very disruptive if the values are meant to be universal and apply to everyone. Right. Um, and, and as we talk about these sort of battle between values, China certainly sees itself uh, in a much stronger position and, you know, it can therefore assert its influence, not just with the United States, but across the globe uh, in the form of, you know, what some call the sort of wolf warrior diplomacy style. Uh, and it reminds me of something you said a few months ago uh, when you presented your testimony before the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, I think it was in September of 2020, uh, you said that China's greatest problem is overstretch and overconfidence, but a severe global economic crisis might well radically change the way that China behaves. Uh, and, you know, we've definitely seen in the last few months uh, something like a severe global economic crisis, if not just that. And in light of that, how do you see China managing the potential for overstretch and overconfidence? I mean, the last year, as COVID-19 has set in, we've seen the beginnings of a fairly deep potential recession. I, I think we're unfortunately probably at the beginning of this story and not a very deep way into it. And the hope is that the world will be restored to growth later this year as things open up. 
and more people are vaccinated and you know this recession is not going to be quite as terrifying as at the moment it <laughs> kind of threatens to look like now for china it's national people's congress in march this year said that there'll be a target at six percent growth this year and it hasn't given targets for the following years it will be pragmatic and for the first time just not kind of tie itself to five-year long targets and it's very likely it'll achieve that because you know it's kind of restoring a lot of the growth that was lost in the early part of last year building up on the capacity it's got for domestic growth through this dual circulation idea that Xi Jinping has been promoting. So that's kind of rising consumption in China. These are all things that the Chinese government has wanted to achieve for a long time. And this might be the kind of shock to the system that delivers that and makes Chinese people more kind of willing to spend money in their own environment and spend it on more locally produced things. Now, I mean, if China is going to uh, achieve that um, and succeeds in achieving that, uh, then, I mean, it's in a relatively strong position compared to others. Uh, I mean, I think it's very aware as a sort of um, strategic entity, the Communist Party of China. Uh, it needs to really keep a grip on the levers of potential growth, the commanding, you know, kind of industries like the state enterprises and offering inducements to state enterprises in the terms of you know subsidized costs all the kind of things that cause it grief outside of china but mean that it can at least have some control of what's happening within china but i mean these are things which could be knocked offside if the recession in the west of the world, rest of the world is much deeper than was expected and if in fact it becomes a depression i mean china still has a lot of growth coming from export markets and their disappearance would be a problem. I mean, it is a very integrated economy. It's not possible to decouple. I mean, a lot of things that China does are totally dependent on the world around it. Semiconductors, it's not got any capacity to produce these to the sort of quality it needs at the moment. And so it's still very, very dependent on external technology. It's catching up in some areas, and in some areas, it's already pulling ahead, like artificial intelligence and areas of, uh, you know, kind of life sciences. It's, good, you know, kind of doing well. But I think it's still not at the point where it can basically say, we are very stable, we've got our kind of own domestic sources of growth, and the, the outside world can basically just, you know, be forgotten. I mean, it, that may never happen, but it certainly can't happen at the moment. So I think the quandary that we're in is that China's growth is really important to the rest of the world. That is despite the very severe political issues at the moment. And if China uh, kind of, you know, if the outside world does have catastrophic problems with its economies, which hopefully it won't, but if it does, that's also a problem for China and ditto China's poor performance will also be a problem for the world because it's also a source now of more and more growth. Right. Um, I want to explore further uh, one specific thing you said there, which is that China's uh, economic target uh, is likely you know, going to be 6% and well reach that. Uh, and it seems to me in the way that these five-year plans are made, uh, lots of people uh, you know, are of the opinion that uh, Xi Jinping is almost underreaching uh, in his goals. Uh, and you know, it seems a bit counterintuitive to me that an authoritarian leader with a centralized leadership style who's trying to consolidate uh, domestic legitimacy would, you know, under reach goals. Usually we think, you know, they'd be quite, they'd set quite ambitious targets to fuel optimism, to uh, get the people to believe in them. Um, so why why is it that, that Xi Jinping does that? The context is really important. The fact that the pandemic has been raging for the last year means, I think, even the central planners in Beijing know they were offering really, really strong and ambitious targets, this wouldn't be believed in. And so, I mean, this is one of the kind of contradictions that, I mean, for, sorry, many, many years, people have complained so much about China, you know, the Chinese government saying things and being very, very exaggerating and using flamboyant language. And then when it starts to sort of do things in a more modest way, and a way which is probably much more achievable. Uh, then there's another criticism that actually, you know, why isn't it being ambitious? Why isn't it kind of, uh, uh, you know, being a bit more uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, testing itself? Um, the issue really is that uh, 
the five-year program that was released this year, the 14th, still has the same strategic targets, basically, which you know are to create more domestic consumption, to be more sustainable, to be more energy efficient, to maintain decent levels of growth, to address issues in the healthcare sector, to address climate change issues. So these are structural issues that can't really be changed. And I guess that there's an acknowledgement that now that China is a middle-income country and much more developed than in the past, well, having the kinds of historic five-year programs where everything was going to be bigger, better, and vaster than ever before belongs to the old world. This is a government which is trying to use a more modern and, I guess, more cautious tone. And I guess for the outside world, that should be a good thing, right? I mean, we're not faced with the usual communist bombast. We are faced with, a, a, you know, kind of Chinese style of trying to be more realistic about the goals that they're setting themselves. Um, and I think that's probably a good thing. The Xi Jinping leadership has been coruscatingly criticised for its authoritarianism, the fact that Xi Jinping is seen as a dictator, uh, the repression, the human rights issues, all of these are well documented and are accurate descriptions to a point. However, we also have to acknowledge that the outside world was urging China to have more clarity about the laws that it was using. And commercially, and in fact, even in some civil society areas, there's absolute clarity about the laws. They may be laws that the outside world don't like, but they're being implemented. So it's not like there are kind of laws that have no meaning because no one takes any notice of them. China is now, in that sense, and with socialist you know, Chinese characteristics, a place where there is rule by law. I guess also the other thing is that in the past, China was always accused of saying one thing and doing another. And under Xi Jinping, whether we like it or not, what it says it does. And I think that's also a really interesting change because it seems that this is a very, very big problem for a lot of commentators, that the fact that it is saying what it does is something that people never thought before would really happen and aren't really able to deal with. The fact that it might be doing things which are very difficult and confronting for the world outside, well, that's another matter. But you can't accuse it of too much hypocrisy these days it is pretty unambiguous with the way that it says it's going to do things and why it's doing things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I definitely agree with your broader point that, you know, it's harder to accuse uh, Xi Jinping of hypocrisy nowadays. I think certainly one area uh, where it might be worth doing that is the human rights issue. Uh, you know, much dominating the headlines last week, uh, the European Union, the United Kingdom, the US and Canada uh, imposed sanctions on officials in Xinjiang uh, for the detention uh, of over a million Uyghur Muslims and, you know, related uh, human rights abuses. Uh, I think it's also worth noting this was the first time the European Union, I believe, sanctioned China over human rights abuses since the 1989 uh, Tiananmen Square crackdown. Uh, and Dr. Brown, you gave an interview uh, at Al Jazeera about this last year. Uh, which you know generated a fair bit of controversy, and I'm curious to know, as someone who's been watching this issue closely, uh, what do you think uh, would make the most effective Western policy response uh, to China's appalling human rights abuses? Well, it's an absolute minefield. On the one hand, you have a Chinese government which I think is rational, and by that I mean I don't think it's guided by racial issues. I mean I think it, it's not like it's kind of waking up in the morning, leaders in Beijing and saying, how are we going to kind of duff up ethnic minorities in China? What it's um, obsessed by are these issues of stability. And part of that is because of what it's seen in the outside world, where it has seen significant terrorist threats, which sometimes nearly got out of hand in Europe and America, not just in the Middle East. And I think that has kind of really become a point of obsession by this leadership. So rightly or wrongly, I think they are promoting a preemptive security philosophy, particularly in Xinjiang. Uh, and they are, um, you, you know, kind of, so, of course, preempting security issues is a bit of a problem because how do you know there's a security issue until something happens to prove it's a security issue? But I think that is what they are doing. 
um, because they have this absolute obsession with stability. Uh, the second is that this is a techno dictatorship in a sense. If you want to describe it as a dictatorship, it's a dictatorship of techno um, technology. Uh, the Chinese government today has a suite of technological devices and solutions and surveillance technology that it never had before. I'm sure when I was uh, going through Xinjiang for six weeks in 1995, I'm sure if they had the technology they have now, then it would have been applied. The situation in 1995 was um, not good. Uh, it was repressive then. Um, it was repressive when I went back in 2002. I haven't been since, so my knowledge of the situation on the ground, I acknowledge, is out of date, and I don't disbelieve the reports that have been offered by the BBC and others. But I think um, if you have two ways of responding to this, the first, which is understandable, is to morally condemn it. And, I, I mean, that's what many people do and should do. I'm not denying that. But that's going to get nowhere in Beijing. I mean, they've made it clear. This administration, this government, until it goes, if it ever does go, has said it does not want to take lectures from the West. When you think of what they did in the Middle East over the Second Gulf War, when you think of the adventures they've had, you know, throughout the last decades in the Muslim world, uh, you know, they just don't want to hear it. I think they feel that we're hypocrites. Um, or our governments are hypocrites. On the other hand, if you do want to have a debate or a dialogue with the only people on the planet who can really do anything about the situation in Xinjiang, that, alas, whether you like it or not, is the leadership in Beijing, and in particular the leadership around Xi Jinping. And you're going to have to have that dialogue. And if you want a dialogue, you're going to have to at least, val not validate, but acknowledge that the Beijing government has a philosophy of security, which is very different maybe to the Europe or America, but that somehow one has to demonstrate on a policy level that what it's doing in Xinjiang is counterproductive. That might be because it will create antagonism in the Muslim world, which will mean that China's assets abroad will be vulnerable to attack. That's one possibility. It might be that you could prove through experiences of similar repressive measures, for instance, in Europe, in, uh, you know, kind of Northern Ireland, for instance, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, you know, kind of these prove that you need to use a political solution. You can't use heavy uh, security and surveillance and repression. You can go along that route, but that means dialogue. If you don't want dialogue, then you can condemn, but you have to live with the consequences of no real change, probably in Xinjiang. And other areas in China, Inner Mongolia too, is an area where there were language protests earlier um, this year, sorry, late last year. Tibet, I mean, it's not as high profile now as it was in the past, but that's been persistently an issue uh, of the kind of treatment of Tibetans and religious practice there. Uh, I mean, at some point, you have to make a choice that your moral condemnation of something uh, can take you so far, but then you have to think practically. And although there are many, many very noisy critics of, you know, any attempt to at least say that the Beijing government, you know, and there needs to be dialogue with them on this issue somehow, um, I don't see any other kind of pathway to try and deal with this. I mean, if you want to deal with it, you've got to have that dialogue. Uh, and so while I can see that there are, there's a big kind of audience um, for berating China and Many people, I think, are sincere in their kind of criticisms. But I also think that there are plenty who are very vocal in their criticisms and were vocal about maybe the words I used last year, because to them, the very existence of a communist-run country is politically something they just can't live with. Well, you know, this is obviously something that they can, an issue like human rights is something that they can weaponize, and many of them do. But for me, it's an issue about how do you improve you know, kind of the situation on the ground. And that means, again, dialogue and engagement. And if there's no dialogue or engagement, I mean, the problem is China is not a small country that you can sanction and block off. It's a fifth of the world economy. It's a fifth of the world's population. It's likely to be the world's biggest economy. So this is not an issue where you can basically just kind of draw a big, big line around China and box it in 
it's not going to happen that way, I'm afraid. It's going to only be for engagement or uh, there are going to be no kind of real attempt, no real uh, ability to change the situation in, in if you care about it in, in these areas at all. That's very interesting. I mean, I do want to challenge that that notion a little bit because I think certainly quite a few people listening to this podcast uh, would be quite skeptical of, you know, the idea of using dialogue and engagement with China over uh, things such as human rights abuses. You know, it might work for economic and trade policy, but certainly I you know, I personally don't foresee Beijing at any point uh, backing down from its stance that uh, the Uyghur Muslim, Muslim detention camps are simply re-education camps or, you know, they're for warranted uh, security concerns. And insofar as it's a reality that they're not going to back down from that, if the West engages in dialogue and, you know, engagement with China over this issue, uh, some might fear that this just might legitimize uh, to some degree what China is doing. Uh, and, you know, at the very least won't result in any kind of fruitful sort of policy outcome. What would you say to skeptics like that? Well, I mean, you've got options. None is ideal. I mean, one option is that you try and deal with China as a sort of divisible entity where you will deal with the good part of China and the issues where there should be cooperation, like climate change and these kind of things, but make sure that nothing touches on Xinjiang. But I don't see how you can really carve China up like that. And as you see with the supply chain issues that have been happening recently uh, for companies, it's not easy to kind of make your, you know, engagement with China so nicely ring fenced. The other is to completely cut off all contact. I and mean, if you feel so strongly, and some do, you know, very very powerfully that this is unacceptable, um, then you have no contact with China at all. That means that a fifth of the world's economy and a fifth of the world's population is behind a wall, and it's probably not possible. It's an impossible thing to implement. So I don't see what other option you've got apart from having dialogue. Uh, well, the shape of that dialogue, the form of that dialogue is important. I, I mean, legitimizing China's position, I think uh, in our diplomatic practice, Europe and America have had dialogue with many, many different kinds of parties. We've got lots of experience of talking to people who we often find very, very abhorrent and difficult. And in some of those have been allies. I mean, one wouldn't say that the Saudi Arabian regime at the moment was a particularly pleasant one. And yet America and Europe have all sorts of relationships. And it seems that we can do that. We have issues with the human rights situation in the occupied territories to talk about a particularly sensitive issue and yet we kind of still manage to say we should have dialogue with particular governments that are involved in that. I mean, it seems to me that this issue of China um, is different because of the size and magnitude of China as a player. The fact that it is not available to the sorts of, you know, kind of measures that may have been used in the past when very, very difficult things, you know, happened, accusations of genocide, for instance, this is usually something one associates with small, unstable countries. Very tragically, with China, it is not like that. It poses particular problems. And so I think of the three options that I've outlined, it seems to me the only practical one and the only one that is kind of going to lead eventually somewhere is engagement. Now, I mean, let's remember, whatever the Chinese government is doing in Xinjiang, it would probably be a very, very huge expensive operation. And even the Chinese government has limits to what it can spend. So I suspect, as of anything else in China, uh, the economics will dictate where this ends up. And I mean, I, I think, you know, it's very hard to think how you can implement these colossally expensive measures uh, in the end, when they, you know, in, in ways which should make them sustainable. I don't think they are sustainable. And we just have to live for the day when there are different views and different voices in Beijing that will think about things in a different way. And I, I hope that will happen. I hope that will happen soon. Right. And, and and I mean, one pathway forward, some might argue, isn't one that comes from government at all. It comes from the private sector. Uh, you know, this week, uh, lots of notable uh, big brands have stopped buying cotton from Xinjiang, um, you know, among them Nike and H&M. Uh, and in response to that, the Chinese government started shutting down stores of these companies and removed them from kind of e-commerce sites across the country. Um, but, you know, I want to ask you, do you think this is the right decision on the part of businesses to make this kind of move uh, when it can be met with such ire from, you know, the CCP? 
Uh, and secondly, how do you see this playing out? Uh, is this the st- is this kind of an outlier, or is this the start of a bigger trend of you know a greater economic decoupling uh, between the U.S. China, uh, or is it simply the case that the economic incentives of you know serving as you say a fifth of humanity, this massive Chinese consumer market, uh, necessarily outweighs business concern uh, over human rights? Well, I mean, the companies H and M and Nike and others who've been involved in this uh, have had a torrid time and are being, uh, you know, criticised in China now. I mean, it's the problem. You've got supply chains in China. You can't truly say how how you know kind of they're policed, and it's not easy to get total transparency. And so, you know, they've kind of got big commitments there. Nike has been. Um, you know, exposed to these kind of issues before in China with the use of child labor on some of its um, kind of, uh, you know, products. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's a broader point. It's not really an answer to your question because we think this is ongoing. And I guess China's going to create its own brands. I think, you know, it's not really interested in the story of being some sort of supplier of partially finished goods. Or, I mean, I think it wants to go up the chain and it's sort of already got a kind of, uh, traction to start producing higher technology goods and moving into services too. So I think that's where this story will probably go. But I mean, to me, the you know kind of interesting thing is, I mean, I've been dealing with China and aware of China since the early 1990s. I mean, I, think I first visited 30 years ago, 1991, just for a week, um, and then went back to live there in, in total for about six years. I've visited about 100 times and, you know, my professional life has been thinking, writing, you know, dealing with China most obsessively for a couple of decades now as a diplomat and then in a think tank and as an academic. I was just thinking recently, in the early 1990s when I first went to China, the story was, number one, place with like 1.3 billion people that are just going to kind of make you as wealthy as hell one day. You know, that's all you've got to do. Just go there and sell your kind of one product to all these people and you're going to make it big. And that was the sort of first story. The second story was a human rights hell where people are, you know, kind of suffering. and It's it's just, you know, an, a bottomless kind of hell of human misery. And that was the sort of dominant narrative that always existed, uh, I think, in media particularly. Also, in a lot of responses, you either had people on one side or the other, you know, either they were crazy about the business opportunities or they were very concerned about the suffering of Chinese people. And I suppose, you know, I'm surprised that with all the complexity of China these days, when you've got many people in China visibly doing well, when you've clearly got a lot of support for the nationalistic message of Xi Jinping, even if not for the political message, when you've got so much integration and involvement by Chinese students with the outside world, when you've got a society which is clearly very kind of multidimensional, um, well, why is it that we still are using these old narratives to approach something which is obviously no longer available to those narratives? It's like trying to, you know, dig a sort of vast field with you know stone age implements you know i mean we need to kind of modernize our narratives now and i guess my only i mean for all the people have strong views about dealing with china and you know the human rights issues in china my only plea is there's got to be some space for nuance now i mean i think about um a year and a half ago i got involved in another very pointless, infrequent fight on social media, which I uh, refrain from as much as possible, where someone, you know, kind of, who actually is, I mean, until then had been very reasonable saying, you know, well, nuance is just an excuse. Every single time someone uses this word, they're just being, you know, kind of, they're trying to, uh, you know, give China excuses. But I mean, nuance is our business, right? I mean, this is not an issue that's going to be sorted out with a kind of categorical good, bad, black, white, you know, right, wrong uh, sort of menu of options. No, it's just not going to happen that way. China operates on a way which means that if you don't have nuance, you're just not going to get anywhere. And that's the only plea I make, even for an issue as stark and difficult as the ones you've been talking about, and including Hong Kong and other issues, 
And alas, it's not easy to sort these out without having some kind of nuance, even though our emotions might take us in other directions. Right. And speaking of kind of modernizing a narrative and having nuance, it seems like that's precisely what the Johnson government has at least, you know, attempt has been attempting to do uh, when it came out with its uh, recent foreign policy review, uh, where a big priority for them is China uh, in kind of a broader context of an Indo-Pacific tilt. And, you know, you've written an entire book on what Britain's economic relationship with China specifically should look like in a post-Brexit environment. Uh, and also as, you know, a former British diplomat, what do, you, what do you think is primarily, primarily driving the shift uh, of the UK towards China? Is it the push away from the European Union, uh, where the Johnson government's just scrambling to establish new relationships to justify this global Britain narrative? Or is it more of a pull factor that you know China's economic model is just so inherently mm-hmm. complementary to the UK, and we're finally realizing it? Well, I mean, I think the UK is obviously in a very strange position because it needs new economic partners if it's going to make a success of Brexit. And yet, on the other hand, you know, kind of China is potentially one of the most promising, but politically we are as bad as we've ever been at the moment. I mean, arguing about literally anything. Hong Kong, obviously Xinjiang, now the sanctions imposed on parliamentarians and then one academic in the UK. And I have to say, you know, for the record, the imposition of sanctions on anyone is not a great idea, I don't think. Um, but uh, it's particularly unfortunate that there was a, a British academic who was included in that list. I mean, I I think that's most unfortunate and really can't help anyone. And and the same with the European Union um, sanctions that that China imposed. So, you know, kind of, I think Johnson is fighting for air um, in terms of trying to create um, a solution to this problem of the United States being very demanding, oh my pardon, the United States being very demanding about wanting allegiance and, you know, kind of um, collaboration on dealing with China, um, the UK having economic needs that China might meet, the UK also acknowledging that China is a key partner in climate change and dealing with other, pan, you know, pandemic and other issues, and also an acknowledgement that the values are so different that there are significant misalignments, to say the least. And finally, the particular role of Britain in Hong Kong. Um, and all of this is sort of thickened by the uh, problem of, you know, the British narrative about itself and it, it's kind of internal debate at the moment about, you know, the, our imperial history. Um, I mean, when you have the sanctioned MP, Ian Duncan Smith, uh, bizarrely putting out a, you know, video of him kind of sort of um, congratulating Hong Kong on I think it's 180th anniversary in existence. You kind of have to wonder what these politicians, you know, really, really want from this. I mean, I don't know, Chinese politicians sort of sitting and talking about, you know, looking forward to the peaceful reunification of Northern Ireland and and the Republic of Ireland (laughs) wouldn't be welcome. I mean, you know, it wouldn't be a welcome message, I imagine, in Westminster. So I sort of think sometimes the, you know, kind of best thing that the UK could do before anything else is sort of climb down from this great kind of platform of, you know, being exemplary as di- d- democratic country and, and all the rest of it. And maybe just sort of thinking a more self-interested and structured way. And I think the integrated review probably isn't a bad place to start. Hi, Professor. Thank you so much. There's been an incredibly insightful discussion that we've had so far. And I wanted to take this opportunity to transition, uh, to make a transition to the Asian region and uh, the implications moving forward of all the current geopolitical developments um, for China-Southeast Asia relations, as well as um, China's uh, relationship with Hong Kong. So I think to kick this off, um, I'd like to recall an interview that was reported in Chinese. So I will be translating this on my own accord and I'm sorry in advance for any translation errors. Um, that was reported by the Institute of Public Policy, um, South China University of Technology. And in this interview, uh, you made a very interesting remark um, and, and I'd like to pick up on that. And you said, and I quote, um, that China is facing the same problem that America had, which is that the bigger the country, the more likely it is to be attacked or Um, in other words, to face criticism. Um, I think the interesting thing about this is that a lot of people would say that size is also what allows bigger countries to push smaller countries around. Um, 
So I'm interested in knowing, broadly speaking, what your thoughts would be on this. Well, I mean, size is important if you're a Confucian country. <laughs> and I think China has a sort of patriarchal view in many ways towards smaller countries. I mean, Yang Jiechi, the um, state council, I think his formal position is who's the most senior person explicitly dealing with foreign affairs in the Chinese central government, made some comment about a decade ago that, you know, kind of small countries just have to sort of put up with what big countries do. But I think also small countries can sometimes have advantages. I mean, North Korea is a great example. I mean, 23 million people, a pretty tiny economy compared to China. And yet you would say that it, it has a, a policy that exploits China's, you know, kind of size uh, advantage over it and, and manipulates China all the time. So I, I think, you know, for the right diplomacy, I mean, Singapore has been quite effective, I think, at working with China, despite you know, kind of some big differences and some problems in the past. I, I think, you know, sometimes not being a significant player has advantages. Um, and I think China is sometimes susceptible to being treated as the big brother or the big sister uh, and not, you know, kind of doesn't want to um, be seen as being uncaring. The psychology of Chinese diplomacy is often, you know, quite patriarchal and quite Confucian, even though it's been a communist system for over seven decades. That's very interesting to me, Professor. And on that note, right, I think it is definitely true that many governments in Asia have seized the opportunities presented in the form of investment and other kinds of economic stimulus that have been offered by Beijing. At the same time, though, we see a rise in pro-democracy sentiment. For instance, um, I think last year there was a hashtag Milk Tea Alliance that arose out of, um, I think, what was primarily Thailand, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, um, as well as, of course, tensions in the South China Sea region. I think very recently, Indonesia and Japan have just started joint drills in the South China Sea. Um, so because of all of this mounting opposition to Chinese presence in various domains in Asia, I'm interested in knowing what um, you foresee of China Southeast Asia um, sentiments um, over the next few years. Do you foresee Southeast Asian governments being pressured by domestic forces or you know, just by foreign policy considerations to take a harder line towards Beijing? Or do you think that um, the potential of economic cooperation will still supersede these other concerns? Yeah, I mean, Asia is basically two places. One is economic Asia and the other is security Asia. Economic Asia is dominated by China and countries that you've mentioned, but many others around the periphery of China you know, for them, it's just not easy to have no benefit and gain from, you know, dealing with the Chinese economy. I mean, they, they can't ignore it easily and they have to work hard to find alternatives. Security Asia, however, is a different place. And there, America is still because of the uh, Navy that it's got, but also because of its security alliances that sort of dot across the whole region from Japan down to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, you know, it's very, very powerful and very dominant. I think China is really keen to move into that security space because it's in its self-interest. It wants security, you know, kind of uh, a, a sort of corridor around it. It feels as the world's second biggest economy. It needs to have that kind of um, flexibility. And it's, well, it's now got a very significant navy, I mean, technologically behind the United States, but, you know, in terms of vessels comparable to it. So I think for all the countries in the region, they are perpetually balancing their economic and security interests, as is everyone else these days. And most of them, you know, China is their biggest trading partner and probably their biggest economic partner, but probably there are significant political issues. Vietnam is a contester in the South China Sea, so is Indonesia, so is Malaysia, so is the Philippines. Um, other countries, you know, have specific issues that they kind of don't see eye to eye with China. I mean, South Korea, of course, is not an ally of China. It's an ally of the United States, and so is Japan. I mean, I think what they're all trying to do is to create uh, an option, uh, you know, that kind of gets them away from over-dependence on China. But I think with every passing day, that gets more difficult because China's economy continues to grow. And their options are sort of limited. The Indo-Pacific, you and uh, the previous discussion referred to, um, 
is an area that everyone would love to exist, but I don't think it really has much coherence at the moment. And of course, India sits at the heart of this because its relationship with China is extremely difficult, and in many ways, probably the most difficult in the long term to see being stable. I think the two countries have a similar sort of nationalism and a similar aspiration to be dominant in their region economically and geopolitically, and the region is probably not big enough for both of them. At some point, there probably will be significant tensions that may get out of hand between them. Would you say, though, that the constrained um, policy menu of Southeast Asian countries towards uh, Beijing is a result of the status quo, like sort of established policy of the Trump administration, for instance, pivoting away from this region? In other words, what I'm trying to ask is, do you foresee there being any substantial changes in Southeast Asian government attitudes towards China um, if we see um, more uh, a greater rollout of resources and of attention um, paid to the Southeast Asian region from the Biden administration? I think my understanding is that most Southeast Asian and South Asian countries are realists. They're not beholden to particular ideologies, and I don't think that they're idealistic about this. They're very realist. And I think that their assessment will always be You've got to balance, you've got to take from China what you can, you've got to get benefit to make yourself strong, but you've also got to be a pragmatist and recognise that China's not going to go away and you can't wish it away. So, I mean, I don't think they're into containment, they're into probably uh, more refinement where they have uh, a bigger collection of potential allies. I think they are also a country, as many of them, that have a similar narrative of colonisation Sovereignty was hard won for them. And in a strange way, China is the champion of those kind of countries. I mean, it emerged from a brutal experience of humiliation and colonization, you know, in the last 150 years. And like it or not, the Communist Party of China has delivered the sort of unified country. You could argue that it did it by, you know, sort of uh, deception or however you want to kind of say that but the point is that today this country that was you know only 50 years ago um suffering from mass famine um this country that was only 70 75 years ago you know in the midst of a brutal war where it was you know kind of almost unlikely not to survive today is poised to become the world's biggest economy and i think for the asian region that is the sign of an enormous geopolitical shift which is something that will bring big challenges, but also big benefits. It's not straightforward. I definitely agree with you on this, Professor. And um, another thing that I did want to talk about uh, is actually the Chinese government's, um, you, you know, many commentators have talked about how the Chinese government has begun deepening its outreach to the ethnic Chinese diasporas um, in Asia, but also in the rest of the world. Do you think that this is part of their political, uh, an important part of their political strategy? And what, if any, complications do you think that this might induce in uh, relationships between China and the rest of Asia? Well, I think the Chinese diaspora um, has always been important. I mean, in the uh, kind of 1960s in Indonesia, I mean, China wouldn't recognize uh, Indonesian citizenship by people who claimed that they were ethnically Chinese, ethnically Han Chinese. It continued, this was a big issue with the, you know, Indonesian government, that it, you know, China continued to say it had a sort of uh, rights over uh, these people. Um, and then, of course, later, during the reform and opening up, well, the, you know, kind of relatively small but quite wealthy uh, ethnically Chinese population of Indonesia were amongst many diaspora communities that you know, invested in China and went to help China develop and, in a sense, have been investors in what we have today. I think the problem is that for the ethnic Chinese diaspora throughout the region, they are often um, politically suspected. I mean, in Australia, I think ethnic Chinese have been suffering quite a lot of kind of suspicion and accusations lately. Um, sometimes stirred up, you know, by kind of um, political actors or, or even academics. I mean, it's incredible the deterioration of the, you know, kind of environment in Australia uh, about particularly Australian uh, 
Chinese. Um, but you've got many other examples of this, even in the United States at the moment. It's most unfortunate. Um, you know, I, I think whether this audience is going to be one that can be used by Beijing is obviously a problem because it will create suspicion and it will end up being lose-lose. The thing is that if you kind of create a narrative where it's like you, no matter where you are, if you're ethnically Chinese, um, must be supportive of the current regime in Beijing, well, I mean, it's very divisive at the moment and it will probably kind of be very counterproductive because firstly, it's unlikely that um, you know, this this sort of group of people will then be able to live very comfortably with that kind of role. And secondly, I don't think it's a message that people are willing to hear at the moment who are not part of that community. So I think it's something the Chinese government, if it is doing, should probably stop doing. Thanks a lot for that, Professor. And um, at this point, I think let's turn our discussion towards Hong Kong. Um, very, very recently, in fact, um, Today, what happened was that the National People's Congress Standing Committee um, voted to endorse a proposal that would uh, expand the legislature in Hong Kong to 90 seats from 70. And uh, out of the 70, you know, currently out of the 70 seat legislature, 35 are directly elected. This number will then be reduced to 20. Um, in light of all of these recent developments, what do you foresee um, them what do you foresee being the next you know, few changes that will take place um, in the context of uh, China-Hong Kong relations? And I think the second part to this question is how, like, who are the parties that we should be reaching out to to convince them that there should be a win-win outcome, right? Who are the parties that can actually enact change um, given the very like, uh, uh, risky you know, landscape that is to come? Well, I, I mean, it's clear the situation at the moment uh, is that there's one country, two systems, but with the onus on one country. And I think the rubric of autonomy has obviously changed. And, yeah, as a commercial centre, a finance centre, I think Hong Kong is still valuable to Beijing, but probably not overvaluable, but it's still valuable. But I think since 2014, obviously the, you know, kind of contention in Hong Kong, uh, to the Chinese government in Beijing at least, has been something it has become less and less patient with. I mean, my personal view is that probably in 2014, there may have been an opportunity to accept the deal that the, you know, kind of government of the autonomous region, or sorry, the um, uh, special administrative region then uh, put forward for, you know, kind of an electoral committee to then put forward, I think, 10 names to be chief executive. I mean, it was not ideal, but at least it was something. I think the rejection of that meant that things have deteriorated and now it's likely that, in fact, they're going to end up with nothing. And that is definitely not um, a good outcome. I don't know uh, what groups, I mean, business, finance, these have not been agents of change uh, in Hong Kong. They weren't in the British era and they're certainly not in the Chinese um, era. Um, I mean, opposition groups have been uh, battered down. Uh, and dealt with very brutally, and the national security laws have taken in something like, I think, 55 opposition uh, legislators. Um, and within those legislative groups, in any case, there are divisions. Um, so I'm pessimistic about what's going to happen. I think Hong Kong, in some senses, is completely kind of married to the Beijing narrative now, and it's there's no sign that Beijing has changed its stance despite international criticism in the last few months. Um, the only thing that might change this potentially is a kind of big economic downturn in Hong Kong uh, and a sign that the Beijing approach has, um, you know, kind of caused that. But as of today, that's not been happening. So um, I'm pessimistic. Thank you, Professor, for an incredibly insightful discussion and also for accepting our invitation to come onto this podcast. And to our listeners, if you liked this episode, then you're going to love Dr. Brown's book, um, The World According to Sea, and the rest of his works, so please do check them out. That is all for this episode. Um, and to find out more about London Politica, please do visit our website, www.londonpolitica.com, as well as our LinkedIn page. And we also have a social media presence. So do check us out on Instagram and on Facebook. And that's all for today. Thank you, everyone.